Our department's been around for 120 some odd years. There's a, actually a state historical marker toward going toward the parking garage. I'm afraid to put it on the street. You understand the world we live in, right? So uh, take a look. It tells you a little about us. We do a whole lot of things. Uh, we run some alternative schools, multi-district alternative schools. We work with special ed kids. We provide therapy services to special ed kids all over this county and a few on the edge of the county. Uh, we do a whole bunch of other stuff. We've been fortunate enough to work with the after school program that Trina was talking about. I am learning new vocabulary. Yes. Uh, her boss, uh, where, there she is. Hi, Lisa. I didn't see you down there. You probably talked to me at some point. Uh, has taught me we're changing our terminology. It's not about after school anymore, it's about out of school. That intersection time for kids is killing us. We have to start working with that. It fixes some of the problems you're going to discuss today. It's a part of the fix. Nothing is a total solution, but it's a part of the fix. So I'm trying to learn to say out of school, not after school. Welcome to our place. Uh, thank you for being here. I like to brag on my facilities people about this long. This building was built in 1986. It's not new. Uh, guys, do world-class work in everything we do, including facilities. So I dare you to find a place that looks like it's built in 1986 around here. Uh, so welcome to our place. If it makes yourselves comfortable. Here. Um, <laughs> we are here today because we have the rock star, the guru, the cheerleader, the passionate, vocal supporter of all of the work that we do in service is here in Houston today to support us in all things national service. Please just help me welcome with a, just a round, uh, a round of applause, Ms. Wendy Spencer. <laughs> on the stage, where were we? Chicago? Chicago. D.C. It was in D.C. That's right. We had the walk. It was in D.C. And I saw her from so far away and I said, gosh, I wish you could come to Houston and talk to us. And now she's here. So I feel very excited about that. Um, but we are uh, very, very pleased to have her here. And I will bring up Terry Gunnell just to get us started. She wants to know who we all are and what we're doing. So that's really awesome. But I just want to give a shout out to the wonderful people at the One Star Foundation. Like a lot of you here in this room, the reason we're in service and we do well is because the One Star Foundation takes care of us. And there they are. There's Chris and Emily. You guys know them, right? <laughs> all right. So, Karen, it's all you. It's tremendously exciting to be in the room with you today. Uh, as you can see, the National Service family is, is large and encompasses many programs um, with lots of different uh, kinds of folks, lots of different interests. And so it's just, it's really an honor to be here with you today. And it's also exciting to see, since you all know it's the year of the year, it's nice to see so many gray shirts and black shirts and the, the senior core red vests. It's, you know, it, it's really nice to, to see the broad family, so. Do you know how many AmeriCorps alums, just with AmeriCorps programs, we have in the last 20 years? Anybody know? Is it 400,000? Do I hear 600? <laughs> Do I hear 700? 830,000 AmeriCorps alums have successfully completed their year of service. And this is the 20th year. And we'll have a big celebration on September 12th, where we'll have uh, invite all 830,000 AmeriCorps alums and all 75 to 80,000 new AmeriCorps members to raise their right hand and say the oath together simultaneously around the country, it gives me chills to think about it, at the same moment in time on September 12th. We hope to have all four presidents who have been engaged in this, both Bushes and President Obama and President Clinton engaged on that day. So it's going to be a very exciting day. So stay tuned for details of the swearing-in ceremony and the recommitment for America alums um, for you. So Terry, so what I did while I was driving over here, we had so many good questions. Um, I, I, highlighted some on to make sure we had because I knew if we weren't going to have time for all of them. Is that okay? That's perfect. Will that work? Um, great questions. And I love seeing my senior core buddies here. Are you two in the front volunteers or with you said I'm affiliated with? Are you foster grandparents? Yes. Excellent. So great to have you here. And then we have RSVP. Question for RSVP. It was, is it Becky? Becky. 18 counties? Yes. Unbelievable. 
That's got to be one of the largest spread reach of any of the RSVP programs I've heard about. That's very good. Congratulations. And you've got your volunteer with you here as well. It's wonderful. Um, another one, Cameron, my brother's name's Cameron, uh, Volunteer Houston Points of Light affiliate. Now, is it the, there's not a hands-on. This is, this is the we one. Encompass. Oh, it encompasses mm -hmm. all, which is great. Um, and of course, you've got Neil Bush, who we're with today, um, the, announcing a great new blueprint for community action around uh, stamping out it literally said I took a boot with me to the press conference, a Texas boot, and I said, we're going to use this boot to stamp out literacy in Houston and to put more boots on the ground, me and Mayor Corps members, senior Corps volunteers, to help stamp out literacy. And we were kicking it off with the boot today, so there's some ones around the boot. <laughs> Let me get to um, some of your questions, which were great. And I'm going to do this as quickly as I can, so if, if there's anything I'm missing, we have time. Does that work? Yes, perfect. For you? All right. Um, God, you asked some good questions. Um, how do you get um, others to serve? There's one answer to that, one word to this question. How do you get others to serve? You know what it is? Yes. Ask. Uh, it's amazing. Um, the statistics go way down if you don't ask anybody to serve. Just to expect people to, to, step, to wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to go volunteer. <laughs> they just typically don't do that unless you are asking them to do it. You're asking a friend or family member. It, you know, it's a comfort zone thing. People want to sort of, you know, we're joiners as Americans. We're joiners, you know, we want to be in groups. We're very social. And we, we do things because people ask us and they tell us the reasons behind. So, you know, I tell groups, when, especially like volunteers, I don't know how many volunteers you engage, but uh, one group I was with, you know, engaged about 5,000 volunteers and said, Do, would you like to double the number of volunteers next month and how many people engage? And you know, they said, yeah, how do we do that? I said, have every volunteer ask someone else to join them and the thing is most of the time they'll say yes when you think about when you put when you volunteer so ask number one reason um how can we get curious about how we can get veterans and families uh the vet programs if you're what programs are better for veterans and families very good question american legion auxiliary has one of our largest uh, engagement of veterans um, and programs for veterans so contact the american legion auxiliary if you're interested in that. We also have a new program called Vet Success, which we're uh, expanding around the country. Started in Washington State, and the idea was to place a veteran as an AmeriCorps member, so the AmeriCorps member is also a veteran, or a closely connected veteran, like a spouse of a veteran, um, in the college for the purpose that the college students who are veterans on the GI Bill make sure they succeed. Only about half of them are graduating from college, that's not a good thing. Their college scholarship is being provided for um, from us as American citizens to veterans as a, uh, something we can do for them when they come back from serving our country. We need all of them to graduate. And so to do that, we need to help them with all of their issues and problems, whether it's in, in college or outside college and support. So that's a way we can do it as well. We're calling it vet success. But lots of programs around veterans, if you're interested, uh, write us and let us know. We'll, we'll put uh, you in touch with one. A proudest accomplishment in service. This was what is your proudest accomplishment in your service? Now, I didn't know if you were thinking about in the last two years, because we, we've got, I've got 30 years to, to pull from, but let's focus on now. Um, it's something that you've done very well here uh, and in our Austin friend as well, and it's something we've participated in recently, the Mayor's Day of Recognition for National Service. This was an idea that was that happened between uh, Mayor Michael Nutter of Philadelphia and me when I first met with him. My first couple of weeks on the job, he was the head of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. He said, Wendy, I want all the mayors to thank our senior corps volunteers, our AmeriCorps, our AmeriCorps VISTA, AmeriCorps NCCC, and recognize the work they're doing. And I said, Mayor, I'm with you, and I think we ought to take it a step further. Let's have mayors talk about the impact, the difference, that a foster grandparent is having on a child. Let's have them take that day and talk about impact. So I thought the first year we'd have, you know, if we could get just 300 mayors doing this, it'd be really successful, right? First year, we had 832 mayors. Sign up, write proclamations, have events, make statements, have press conferences. Last year, a couple of weeks ago, on April 1st, our second annual, 1,760 mayors 
took the time off that day to thank you all for your service and your impact that you're having. And that I'm really proud of because not just that it, not just that it, 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 they took the time to thank you, and I think it's very important that our mayors and our leaders take the time to do so. I think it generated um, enthusiasm around national service. Who, what is Foster Grant? What is Senior Companion Program? What is RSVP? What's an AmeriCorps VISTA? You know, it actually created the awareness. Literally thousands of media hits on this day occurred. We're still um, looking for all of the media impact. But I'm really proud of that because that's our opportunity to thank you and to think about how can you also address the problems in cities and communities across the country. So I'm certainly real proud of that. I'm proud of the fact that President Obama, on July 15th um, last summer, took the opportunity to welcome and greet President George H.W. Bush to the White House and recognize the 5,000 Points of Light award winner, 5,000 since it started. And then this opportunity at the White House, the President took the opportunity to talk about the legacy of President Bush uh, that has been carried on by all of the Bush family, but, and President Clinton and others. But he took the time to announce a presidential memorandum. It's very much like an executive order. And it's called the Task Force on Expanding National Service. And he named me as the co-chair with his domestic policy advisor, Cecilia Munoz. And the reason I'm proud of that is the president was saying to the country, the national service is important to me as a leader, and I want to find ways that we can expand opportunities. We have hundreds of thousands of people who apply to be AmeriCorps members every year, but we only have about 75 to 80,000 slots. We have waiting lists in almost every senior corps program. Um, and you may, Becky, find this true with your RSVP slots, I don't know. But um, that we're, we only have so many slots for foster grandparents, senior companions, RSVP volunteers, and we need more available slots available. So how can we do this? We can do this by partnering with the private sector, with local governments, with county governments, um, trying to find ways to fund these positions beyond what Congress um, has funded for us. Congress has given us the budget for the 315,000 senior corps positions and 80,000 AmeriCorps positions, but they said, you don't have to stop there. That's all that we have the money for. We can stretch those dollars to have more people serving. And so that's my goal, and I'm proud of the fact that we're trying to do that right now in programs across the country. We're coming up with real creative ways to do it. And if you've got ideas, I want to hear ideas from you as well. So those are a couple of things um, that I'm proud of. Um, this says, uh, it would be wonderful to see a public service announcement for the three senior corps projects in the Houston-Harris County market. Can you envision uh, this happening? So I'll let a little secret out. There is a new public service announcement coming out for the Senior Corps programs and Senior Corps Week. It will be something that you can share uh, free. You'll be able to download it. Um, we'll have all kinds of social media ways to, for you to get it. I previewed it about two weeks ago. It is outstanding. Uh, it is really good and it really gets to the heart um, of the Senior Corps participants and the work you're doing. So look for that coming soon. Um, someone said the PSA for AmeriCorps uh, was up. Did y'all see that when, we were, when you were waiting? It had the what is AmeriCorps, it was typing it. Did you see that or not? Did y'all see that? Some of you saw it. You, it's really good. Um, go to our website if you haven't seen it. Share it on your social media. Don't just like it, but share it with all of your, um, all of your friends and family because it is really fantastic. Um, it's real high tech and it's got great music and it's uh, I think it was a 30 and a 60 second, but it's really good. So we've got one now for AmeriCorps and one for Senior Corps coming up in Senior Corps Week in May. Doesn't the, the Senior Corps in Spotlight West as well? It does. That was it, playing earlier too. We can play that. Oh, you, we, 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 we sneaked that. You got, the, uh, you got a, uh, a little uh, hot, uh, confiscated copy of that? <laughs> a bootleg <laughs> copy? I love that. It's really good. It's really good. It's really good. Well, I don't know if that's some, one thing, because we haven't released the senior girl one. Just the trailer. Oh, the trailer's out. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Well, I should have bootlegged a copy of it. <laughs> should have done that. Um, why can't we use the non-competitive status? Now, this must be for AmeriCorps of VISTA, because AmeriCorps VISTA has non-competitive status, for applying for federal jobs 
before we complete our year of service since it takes months to obtain a federal job? I've got a really good answer for that. Guess what? If you don't complete your year of service, you don't get your non-competitive eligibility status. So if we offered it to you on month six, and you, you know, and you hadn't completed your, you wouldn't qualify for it. So that's a really good policy there uh, to make sure that you stay with us for the entire term. And then you've got this really cool thing called non-competitive eligibility status. Now, we are working on that. No promises, but we're working on it for all AmeriCorps programs. Um, I'm really excited about this. This is part of the task force on expanding national service. One of the goals was not only to expand more opportunities to serve from the president, it was also to look into how can we help those who serve in national service programs um, get future jobs and, and help them with their careers. So we're tackling this for a few different ways. One is working with our federal partners and seeing if we could have a, a policy uh, to expand that uh, national uh, uh, non-competitive eligibility beyond just the VISTAs. So that's one thing. Hope we can pull that off. We've got a ways to go, but we're at least having the dialogue um, in a very serious way. Uh, the other is called, uh, I haven't really officially rolled this out in this way, but I'm calling it, and the AmeriCorps alums are calling it, employers of service. So I'm spending some time talking to corporations, nonprofits, large employers about what, wouldn't you, wouldn't it be neat if you put a box on your application that said, have you served in senior corps or an AmeriCorps program? Check here, please explain. If they really want to take this far, they'll make that a part of the qualifications or at least guarantee you an interview. Maybe. You know, I've always, like, I met a mother of twin boys who have both Eagle Scouts this morning, and I explained to her that I, I have this policy that if I'm looking at job applications, I always interview an Eagle Scout. And, you know, I don't care what their qualifications are, I interview them because I want them to have that experience. Um, I think this is important um, for to, to, to give back to those of you who have served. Um, we have a lot of seniors who are now going back to work. A lot of great experience from the senior programs that you're gaining. Uh, in fact, in the senior companion program, private sector is growing in jobs for senior companions. You can use the experience as a senior companion, as a volunteer, to get a private sector job if you wanted to pursue that avenue. Um, so I'm talking with employers uh, about this. I think this will be something we can give back to you um, for your service. And let me, while I'm talking about your service year, I want to encourage you to say something when you talk about your service. I heard several of you when you were saying, where do you work? I work at. I want you to say, I serve at Case. I serve at uh, wherever you serve. I serve. You can work and get a job anywhere. You are committing a year of your life. It is a year of sacrifice. All of the, those of you in the room who are serving chose to do that. You chose that year of sacrifice. Um, you, chose, you can get a job anywhere, every one of you. You competed for this position, and you beat out many others. In fact, when you pull it together, you beat out hundreds of thousands across the country. You were chosen. So I would encourage you to say where you serve, because that's more giving than actually working. So please do that for me, because you're serving, and that's a gift that you're giving our country through your service. All right, let me get a couple of other questions through. Uh, when, will we, when will we be provided a health care plan that is covered under the ACA? You thought I'd run from that question. <laughs> I'm going to walk out the door and not answer that one. Um, something we're working on really hard. Uh, you know, the, the health care plan has been in place for 20 years. hasn't changed that much. Uh, it's not a bad plan. It's not a health care plan. It's really health care benefits, uh, those of you who have them know. Um, so right now, um, if you didn't have another alternative, like you weren't under your parents you know, or your spouse's health care program that was ACA compliant, um, you will have to pay a $95 um, or something similar penalty at the end of the year when you file your taxes in 2015. Um, let me give a hint to the directors in the room that you can think about, and you're going to hate me for putting me on, me on the spot like this, but you actually could help your members by providing that penalty. You could pay, 
you could give them a gift um, of the $95 to help pay for that penalty. You cannot use federal dollars to do it. Um, it could be considered an income, so you could. You might have to pay taxes on that. It wouldn't be much. Um, but that's just an idea I'm putting out there for you. If you want to help your members defray that cost, that is something you could do for them. Um, it's, so we're working on that. It's not there yet. Um, you know, but there are lots of options now through ACA that you can tap into that weren't available to you previously. Um, like the, uh, for those who are under, you know, the age of 26 and under have got the benefit, like my son does, who's 24, to be covered under my health care insurance. Um, so it's, thanks for the sensitivity, we're working on it. Uh, let's see here. Um, the, oh, do you want to hear how I got my job? <laughs> it's kind of a fun story. Do you want to hear about that? Yes. All right. Um, I was... Liz, uh, Liz Darling is not here today, but she is the head of One Star Foundation, which is the equivalent to the Governor's Commission on Volunteerism, which 53 states, territories, D.C. has across the country that we partner with. And of course, you know, many of the America funds are funded under. And I was the head of the Governor's Commission on Volunteerism in Florida under three different governors, Bush, Christ, and Scott. And in that role, um, in my latter years there, I also was the chair of the association of all the state service commissions, association of ASC. And in that role, I came to Washington a lot, I sat on a lot of committees, a lot of panels, and the White House was looking for this position, and they were being very kind. They were asking for advice about the quality of person you would like to, um, we would like to see in this role. And so, you know, they're very, very nice asking for info. I it was very generous of them, you know. But I leaned over to one of the White House staff and I said, I've got some names. Would you mind if I submitted some names of people that I think would be good? So I'm trying to, you know, make sure I know the person that's going to be in, in the head of it. And I'm going to give them some names. That might work. And I really had some good ideas, I thought, around that. Not my name, other list names. About, I figured, you know, what are they going to do? She said, sure. So I submitted it to them. Justification. So about three weeks later, my secretary comes in and says, you have a call from the White House personnel <coughs> office. Um, who's calling you, and I said, great, they're actually going to respond to my list. And I said, well, get that list out, because that's great. They're interested, you know. So I get on the phone, and I said, well, I've got my list here. I'm ready. Which, who are you interested in? And she said, well, we're actually interested in you. And I said, oh, no, there's a list here of people. <laughs> you know, I didn't really hear her. And uh, she said, thank you very much for your list. We have your list, but we're interested in you. And, um, and so, uh, long story after that, um, lo lots of... Um, uh, interrogation uh, and uh, from both the Senate and uh, the FBI agents who swore your life into investigative background thing and I passed. But I'm uh, very pleased that I was unanimously confirmed by the Senate and ladies, the first woman in this role and the first person from the field in this job as well. So I hope I can recognize you. That's how that happened. But uh, anyway. Um, that and the grace of God has put me in this uh, position, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be your chief advocate and, uh, and a champion. Um, uh, there's one here, let's see. Um, what policies are in the works to increase awareness of AmeriCorps and senior corps programs nationally? Well, I certainly think the Mayor's Day of Recognition helped, and that we'll continue to build on that each year. Public service announcements, we have created them, we need your help to get them out in social media and your local media outlets. So I'm going to lean on you. Um, between the AmeriCorps and Senior Corps programs, do you know that you are serving unduplicated 60,000 locations, sites, schools, locations across America? That's 60,000 opportunities to have a sign that says Senior Corps serving here. AmeriCorps serving here, or both. We've got schools where we have foster grandparents and AmeriCorps members. Um, that's 60,000 locations to make sure that you are well branded on Mondays, Tuesdays, no, every day, every day you're well branded so that everyone around you will know that you have given and dedicated your year to their cause in their community, wherever that community is. 
even if you're working in an office with very few people, you never know the interaction that's going to happen from, tell me what VISTA is, and that opportunity to talk about it. Tell me about the foster grandparent program, and you'll be able to tell your story. And the reason I'm motivated to tell you this, that motivates me, is I walked into school one day, and I was visiting a miracle program, and I can tell you which one it is. It was on the West Coast. And uh, I ran into uh, a teacher and I needed directions to the place I was going to and I asked directions to the location. And I said, well, I'm going to try something here. And I said, hi. I said, do you, do you have an AmeriCorps program here in this school? She didn't know who I was. And she said, AmeriCorps, AmeriCorps. No, I don't think I know what that is. I don't think I, said, oh, really? And I said, well, do you have, and I named the program. Her whole demeanor turned. She said, yes, oh, it's fantastic. Let me tell you about that program. In fact, I don't know how our school can operate without that program. It is so good. I tell her, I mean, she just like went on all these things of reasons that that program was changing their school and their students and their ability to change the lives of their students and achieve the success that they needed. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, I could just see her telling that same story to every neighbor, every person she came on, she told me. And I said, wow, that sounds like a great program. She, oh, I don't know what we do without it. And I said, you know, that's an AmeriCorps program. <laughs> well, people should tell us that. <laughs> so it really motivated me to really encourage everyone to be well-geared, well-branded, talk about it, have signs, because what happens is members of Congress, leaders, mayors, governors, if they don't know that the resources are so valued, the time that you're spending, the skills and talents that you are contributing, if they don't know what it is, and it tied back to the funding decisions that they're making, one day we're going to look around and they're not going to fund us. And, they, and somebody's going to come back and tell them all the things that we were doing. They're going to say, why didn't somebody tell me? Just like that conversation with that teacher. I don't want that ever to happen. So I need your help. It's The year of the gear is 2014, and 15, and 16, and 17, and 18. And as long as any of us are around, um, it will be the year of the gear, so I need your help. I got your help with that, right? Yes. Yeah. All right, you're going to help me with that. So that's how you can help me um, with branding and acknowledgement, but also using your own networks. If we took the time today, and I talked to you about, list all the networks you have, the faith organizations you're a member of, the civic clubs you're a member of, the, the neighborhood or associations you're a member of, your, ex your reach would be huge. Mm -hmm. It would be hundreds, just from this room, of different entities and groups that you can talk about your service and share what you're doing with. Not to mention, now that we have the beauty of social media, which we did not have when this agency was founded. We certainly didn't have, have it when Foster Grandparent was started. Uh, we didn't have the benefits of social media, and we do now, so we can do it with Twitter and Facebook and email and texting and all the different social medias that we can use also to share our reach and what we're doing as well. I talked to a group of high school students the other day about the difference where we've gone in 20 years with national service and I said I put up a picture on the screen of a fax machine. I said this is a facsimile machine. None of you have seen this before. We used to put paper in it. It would come out the other end. And I said now we're, you know, they're like what is that? But, uh, but now we have the benefit of social media so, I, so we should use it. Um, what is, let's see here, um, Disasters, because we have some interest in disasters. <laughs> what resources are available during a time of disaster, and what can we do to prepare to better assist CNCS? Also, what information does CNCS have in regards to disaster preparedness in educating non-proficient literacy groups? Educating non-proficient. I'm not sure where you're going with the non-proficient literacy groups, but I'll tell you how I engaged a literacy group in disasters in Florida. So when I was head of the Governor's Commission in Florida, we were also the head of volunteer and donations management for the state. It's called Emergency Support Function 15, and we were in charge of that. And during 2004 and 5, we engaged 245,000 volunteers in service directly um, in response, and it was like $85 billion in service time and assets that we deployed to people to help them during eight major storms that went through our state. But one of the things we did to prepare for that is every single AmeriCorps program in the state of Florida when we grant funds to them, we have a contractual arrangement that they also have to give basic disaster training to every AmeriCorps member. 
Now, I didn't oversee senior corps programs, so I didn't have the reef range of the senior corps. Um, I don't know if y'all have that in Texas. You got it. All right. So that's a big start. Not a lot of states have that. So take that seriously um, and use it to, you know, use that training to help you. And one of the groups that we deployed was in the western panhandle of Florida, <laughs> where we, we needed help with sheltering. And there's a thing called um, a shelter of last resort that is not a Red Cross certified <coughs> shelter. Cameron knows about this. But it is what you do when you've got a storm coming on. You have a lot of people that need sheltering, and you don't have enough Red Cross certified shelters in place. And you just stand up some shelter of last resort. And we had to do this very fast, and we used an AmeriCorps literacy program to do it. Now, who would have thought reading coaches and teachers um, would be able to be, I mean, usually you think about those who are deploying, you know, the young ones that are tarping roofs and slinging ice and food, and, you know, doing all the heavy lifting and chainsaw certified, you know. Um, but this was a reading group that we said, we called them and said, can you just staff this? And we're going to give you some just-in-time training. And we had a miracle program from St. Louis come in and give them the just-in-time training, and they loved it. We also deployed a reading core group to staff the call line for help. Because what happens in disasters is you get flooded with phone calls on your 211 um, uh, telephone council referral line, and that's a really good role that anyone of any age can do, and you provide the information to them. So you don't necessarily have, have to be the young hot shots, you know, to go out and, and tarp roofs for this. You can also be very diversified, and we've deployed a lot of seniors in this. West Texas is a great story of our senior programs that have done an outstanding job um, in recovering, helping people bring that community after the explosion back to normalcy. We have uh, great information on our website, nationalservice.gov. Uh, our disaster services unit, DSU, at cns.gov. You can write them. They will respond to you on a regular basis about other resources. Terry, you might think of some other things of disaster resources we have, but those are a couple. One star. One star. Uh, VolunteerTX.org, statewide volunteer registration portal that can be activated in time of disaster, but it's really designed to be year round as well. That's so good. And I so you've got some information on, uh, there that is good for preparedness and mitigation. Well, just we interesting situation in Texas is that One Star actually is in the state disaster plan. Um, like Florida was, was yeah. Plan. Yeah, which is great. Um, all right, I'm, ch I'm chalking it through these pretty quick. The uh, uh, health care got, hold on, bear with me. Ask, public service, veterans. Um, okay, I, I know, I would like to know how we can work together as a community to address the issue of illiteracy. And today we announced um, our joining our, our partnership, joining the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation, which is newly established a year ago, to focus on illiteracy in Houston. There is a national foundation that Barbara Bush has um, that I've worked uh, with in my role in Florida, but this one is specifically for Houston. And Dr. Julie Baker Fink is the new director. She's been on board a year now, but she's fantastic. Comes from an education background. And she's heading this up. And Neil and Maria Bush are the co-chairs of this effort. And today what was, was announced is a year-long work with Deloitte Consulting's volunteer pro bono work. A blueprint. Somebody may have a copy of it in their hands from the event. Um, is, does everybody get a copy today? Good. This is an outstanding, um, thanks so much. This is an outstanding blueprint. So what they did is they have surveyed uh, the community and worked on the challenges. But what I like about this is they've also identified recommended actions and a strategy to address four different age groups um, to address from early childhood to adult illiteracy um, around um, illiteracy in Houston, and they pulled together all the experts, many of the national service experts, um, together to announce the mayor was there, uh, Congresswoman Jackson Lee was there, um, Judge Emmett was there, who's also heading it up, to support the Bush family and this foundation 
um, to come rally around this. Now, how, what does that mean for national service? We have committed $300,000 in resources for AmeriCorps Vistas over the next three years to partner with them for the Vistas to be the team of Vistas to be the ones to stand behind the standing up the initiatives to identify ways that we can use these strategies um, both inside and outside of national service volunteerism to address it. I know Volunteer Houston is going to be a part of this as well. Um, they talked about you today. The um, school district here, of course, uh, Dr. Sawyer was there today with his support. This is, uh, and the VISTA members are going to help on stand the initiative up um, and even maybe in some cases assess how we can scale and grow existing national service programs in the area of education. And also, are there some programs around the country that are very effective that aren't located here that we might want to recruit into Houston to complement some of the gaps that may not be currently served? Uh, Mary Ellen's one of those we're looking at um, from the reading program. But uh, there's lots of ways we can attack this. What I like about it is that everybody's coming together to focus on this blueprint, which is so well articulated, what the gaps are. So I encourage you to purview, uh, purview this and read it and, um, and figure out how you can be a part, whether you're in education or not, um, how you can be a part of this as a citizen of this wonderful community because it's got a lot in here and some of you are already engaged in this and I thank you in advance for that because you're already working on the problem at hand. So that's how we can very effectively uh, help make sure we're a partnering around the literacy in the state, in the city here. I think I've just about got them all. Uh, there was a question about, um, we work so hard to make sure kids are prepared for college, but when they get to college, and then we just say, okay, hands off, you got the college, our job's done, turn next student. Not so. We need to be staying with those college students, especially those first generation college students, mentoring them, staying right with them, um, sh you know, shouldering that burden together. Um, and we have College Advising Corps here, College Possible, College Access, lots of great College Forward. And we know the college programs I'm missing, I mean, it's great, um, that, can't, you know, that know how to do this well. It's not only about getting access to college. That is a big part of the problem, I mean, a part of the solution. But it's also making sure that it's successful in college, like I mentioned with the vets. So yes is the answer. We need to be working on that and focused on that. Um, I want to see the college success rate grow as well as the high school graduation rate grow, which is a really good trend. For the first time last year, Grad Nation announced that we are, had the highest gain in the last 30 years of the high school graduation rate uh, increasing. And we'll hear on Monday where we are at Grad Nation's um, report, new report at their annual meeting in Washington, D.C. this Monday, where we are today and this year. And I'm excited to learn about that. And we're making good progress, but we also need to have the same focus on our college, uh, those who are in college as well. All right, I think I went through the list. What am I missing, Terry? Perhaps the Future Senior Corps. Future Senior Corps. Um, what is the Future Senior Corps programs, and what can we do to show the value of our programs? So a couple of the ways, of course, for our Senior Corps programs here is, I've already kind of hinted to you, is the value of branding, telling your story, I think seniors are in a, have an advantage that our miracle programs don't have. One is the volume of senior core participants is three times as large as our miracle participants. So you've got three times the reach um, at 315,000 senior core volunteers serving in one of the three programs across the country. And I'm going to get the number soon, but it's hovering around the 40 to 45,000 range in sites. It's really, really large. It may be around 40,000, but they're going to give me that number soon so I can uh, articulate that. Members of Congress listen to seniors. They care about your opinions. They care about the work you're doing. And we need to do a better job. And I'm, I'm leaning over here because I have the senior programs here. We need to do a better job, and I need to do a better job with you on promoting the impact that you're having and telling your story. Um, so certainly a marketing campaign around the impact of seniors. Uh, I like the direction we're going on with, with RSVP. I walked in to the competition 
Um, I'm not responsible for that, but I'm embracing it because the, the new competition around RCP, and I heard Becky, you say when you said who you were, your emphasis on education, I believe you said, is one of your That's one of them. priorities, um, which is a good one. But whatever your priority is, the fact that you're focusing is going to give you the ability to tell the story more. And I met with a group of senior core programs in Orlando a couple of weeks ago, and one of the directors who's been around for a very long time, a couple of decades, said, Wendy, I've got to tell you, I didn't embrace this competition among RSVP, but now I, at first, but now I am, because it has forced me, as a director of a program, to be able to document more, better than I did before, of the impact to prepare myself for competition. And now I've got a better story to tell. Not that she didn't have a story to tell before, but now she has, she's motivated to package it differently than she did before. Now, and I'm hearing that from other examples around the country. Um, so that we have to take now that we are doing that. But even our programs that aren't competitively funded, like Senior Companions and Foster Grandparents, we use that model our way to, to really package even better, um, talk to our other programs about how they're doing it, um, to share that story take the data that you're turning into us at a national level and let's work that because it is a dynamic story. Almost more so, you know, AmeriCorps and National Service has a, really I call it the trifecta. The purpose is to help organizations raise the capacity to meet their missions, one. Help more individuals thrive and communities through environment thrive, two. And the third one is about you. The individuals helping you with your life's uh, career choice or your everyday life um, and help you as a person and I think about the oldest living foster grandparent grandma Virginia who I just celebrated her birthday with a couple weeks ago in DC when they entered her into the DC Hall of Fame she started volunteering 25 years ago at the age of 80 She's 105. <laughs> she walks to school five days a week. People offer her rides and she says, no, I need the exercise, thank you. <laughs> she volunteers 35 hours a week. Wow. So if you think you're too old to volunteer, I just say, well, let's look at Grandma Virginia. I am telling you she is standing <laughs> and breathing today because of foster grandparents. So that's the super trifecta there. Um, and I think even more so for seniors, I'm going to go out on them, than even AmeriCorps members maybe who are younger in years, although AmeriCorps members are older too, because I know because of our health research demonstrates to us even the older volunteers, the health benefits, you have a better advantage as an older volunteer than a younger volunteer. The health benefits are better for those who are older than those who are younger. You're, you're going to thrive at your age and live a healthy life at an early age regardless of volunteering, but when you get older, the health benefits really kick in. So that's a message that we've got to tell Congress. Um, so I think the future is really there if we can continue to articulate it. And I, you know, at age, I just turned 53 Monday, at age 53 I'm going to be volunteering a long time because I know the health benefits. But uh, I'm joining your ranks here soon to qualify as a 55-year-old, and maybe that's what I'll do when my term ends here. I'll become a senior corps member, but because um, I can. But uh, but uh, but I really so I'm going to need your help with that. But I think there's a great case there. We need to continue to talk. Anything else? All right. What have I missed from the group? And I know our time is probably up. But we've well, you're busy. You have places to go. Places to go. <laughs> More people to see. But is there anything burning that we miss? It's 2.30, so we've about got it. I hope I've helped you in answering some of these great questions. All right. Good. Good. All right. Awesome. And I want you to hear something from me that's very, very important. Whether you're a member or a volunteer or a staff member who's helping, I want you to hear thank you. And I really mean it. Thank you for your year of service and your commitment as a member of volunteer or as a staff member supporting. Thank you. And ask others to serve alongside you and let's get more people serving. All right? Thank you. One great program that I visited was in West Texas and it was the RSVP program that was helping volunteers recover 
from the explosion in West Texas. But it was so heartwarming to see the community rally around through RSVP volunteers and come and recover that community. That was very, very um, heartwarming to me to see a community, a very small community, highly impacted where RSVP volunteers from our Senior Corps program rallied around. Another great program was with Queen Latifah <laughs> in Toms River, New Jersey, where we were at, in Seaside Park, New Jersey, where we rebuilt a uh, playground for an elementary school, Boyd Elementary School, that was told they were not going to have an elementary school because it was blown down by Hurricane Sandy. So once Queen Latifah found out this, she asked to participate and help and brought in some sponsors, brought in AmeriCorps members, Senior Corps volunteers to help and rebuild that school and we surprised the kids on their first day of school with a brand new playground. That was a pretty special project that I participated in with these AmeriCorps members.